on July the 20th, 2012, the world will be shaken by premeditated mass murder. This true crime just so happened to be when the blockbuster The Dark Knight Rises hit the silver screen. Those eager moviegoers would sadly swap joy and excitement for panic and devastation. James Holmes would be born the 13th of December 1987, San Diego, California. His father, Robert Holmes, was a mathematician and a physicist. His mother, Arlene Holmes, worked as a registered nurse. The family resided in Oak Hills, a neighborhood in Castroville, California. At the age of 12, James moved back to San Diego. It was during this time that he would start to withdraw from social interactions, descending into a deep and troubling state. Despite claims of these concerning behaviours, James Holmes still managed to graduate from Westview High in 2006. During his high school years, he participated in soccer and cross-country running. Holmes, however, allegedly suffered from some mental health problems back in middle school and attempted to even end it all at the age of 11. A sweet and cheerful boy that came from a loving family. He was known as a good kid who took good care of his dog and his baby sister. Life seemed ordinary and pleasant for him. He excelled at school, enjoyed playing basketball and video games, and had fun trips at the beach and went camping in the mountains, and visits to Disneyland during the Thanksgiving period. They were joyful family events. James, he had a life that many kids would actually yearn for, but none would want his future. As he progressed through his school years, he continued to excel. In fifth grade, he spent most of his time with a classmate, coding and creating a website for the school. His teacher applauded his efforts and labelled him a renaissance child. His mother cherished him dearly. He was a long-awaited child. He was everything they could have hoped for. He was quiet, intelligent and overachiever. However, as he grew older, he started to experience discomfort in social situations. His mother instilled values of hard work into him and helping the community whilst despising weakness and she influenced his stoicism. Report cards would consistently show straight eyes across the board and he'd come home with stacks of school and team photos. His father affectionately called him Jimmy, where his mum called him Jim. All observed a boy that avoided fights, rarely showed aggressive behaviour and tried to blend in. However, when he turned 12, things took a darker turn. His family moved to San Diego and this is when his struggles intensified. He found it difficult to make friends and he started isolating himself in his room, spending hours playing video games. His mother went door to door desperately searching for playmates for him, but the boys in the new neighbourhood, they were unkind. She felt sorry for him for not being able to make him happy as she watched his excitement dwindle. According to his defence, what some would dismiss as just a difficult transition were perhaps signs of his mental health deteriorating in the early stages. Even in high school, his cross-country coach saw his attitude as peculiar. He kept to himself and stayed that far out of the way he even ruined the team photo. During his time at the University of California, Riverside, he made a few friends amongst the honor students. His housemates and he found solace in the TV show called Lost, which became the highlight of his social week, rejected by most prestigious graduate schools. He returned home, staying up late and sleeping throughout the days. He seemed lost until his mother suggested to find a job. He ended up working at a pharmaceutical mill as his co-workers noticed him just gazing off into space. Finally, he gained a mission to Anschutz Medical Campus of the University of Colorado after the second round of applications. However, his academic journey really took a toll and he's struggling for the first time. Holmes eventually dropped out after suffering heartbreak. He felt like he was losing the battle with his troubled mind. No matter how much he immersed himself in neuroscience, James Holmes concluded that his broken brain wasn't going to heal itself. Apparently now his focus shifted to planning and executing a mission to prove his own self-worth, to avoid resulting in unaliving himself. He wrote about a disturbing idea of human capital in a notebook and addressing it to a psychiatrist, describing how he believed he could add value to his life by ending the lives of others. According to CBS News, James Holmes had actually visited three mental health doctors in his time at the University of Colorado. One doctor considered placing Holmes in an involuntary mental health hold, 
after learning about his thoughts of committing murder. However, she decided against it. Believing that Holmes only had borderline tendencies and doing this may just anger him further. One of Holmes' psychiatrists was concerned that he had a dangerous mental health disorder. Dr. Lynn Fenton alerted campus police when Holmes had made homicidal statements about a month before he would go on to take many lives. Holmes sent a text to a graduate student about two weeks before the massacre, asking if the student had ever heard of dysphoric mania, a disorder characterised by extreme mood swings. He wanted his student to stay away from him, referring to himself as bad news. Holmes specifically chose the Century 16 Theatre for his plan, because he liked movie theatres. This particular theatre had doors that could be locked. Additionally, he selected an area where the police response would be slower. Holmes targeted the midnight showing, assuming that there would be fewer children there. It was discovered that Holmes had explored the possibility of other locations, one being an airport but ruled it out quickly because of the heavy security. Also, he didn't want his plan to be labelled as terrorism. He carefully chose his tools for this mission, ruling out many that could potentially harm him. On July the 2nd, Holmes ordered spike traps, which he intended to deploy if he was pursued by the police or in a car chase. He even applied to join a firearms club less than a month before that tragic night that would take many lives. On July the 19th, the day had arrived, the day where James would turn his plan into reality. Just hours before the tragedy would strike, Holmes would send a notebook to his psychiatrist. The notebook contained his thoughts and preparations leading up to this point. However, the notebook was found in the mail facility at the Anschutz Medical Campus, as it couldn't be delivered. Shortly before James Holmes was going to execute his plan, he called a mental health crisis hotline, hoping that somebody may convince him not to carry out his dark agenda. Unfortunately, the call was disconnected after only nine seconds. In preparation, Holmes legally purchased a Glock 22 from a store in Aurora on May the 22nd, 2012. Six days later in Denver, he acquired a Remington shotgun. On June the 7th, just hours after failing his university oral exam, he went and purchased a Smith & Wesson sports rifle. Background checks were run for all three of these and they were all obtained legally. Over the internet, Holmes purchased thousands of rounds of ammunition. 12.05 a.m. The premiere for the latest Batman blockbuster. The Dark Knight Rises hit the screen. Fans were thrilled. The previous two movies were great. This could only be a fantastic night, surely. According to an alleged witness of the crimes, during the movie, 20 minutes or so in, there was a gunfight scene. This caused confusion, because stood there was far more than anything this movie could conjure. It was James Holmes. Donning a full ballistic suit, he entered through the emergency exit with his pistol and rifle. Gas mask on, he threw tear gas canisters into the packed screen. The theatre was in a state of panic, the alarm had been raised. James Holmes opened fire on the helpless victims, one after another. James had bottlenecked the theatre to maximise his murder. He stood there firing away at many targets, downing mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. No discrimination of any kind. Everybody was James Holmes' target. Within those 10 awful minutes, hundreds of 911 calls have been made emergency? and the local hospitals were alerted to a mass casualty incident. Five or so minutes later, James had been spotted fleeing the theatre with a gas mask on. A further five minutes had passed and the police had swarmed around James in the cinema car park. He was apprehended at 12.50am. 70 people were injured that night from mild to severe. 12 were left sadly dead. The youngest was just six years old and she had only just recently learned to swim. Three of the young men died protecting their girlfriends and friend. One of the girlfriends left with a life, bullet through her knee, but not with a man she entered with. Another was a father that lost his life, but thankfully his two teenage daughters left physically unharmed. A mother was injured and a son died next to her. 
Even some of the lucky ones that survived, like Petra Anderson was shot square in the face, to the left of the nose ripping through the top of her skull. Aiden lost his arm due to the heinous acts of James. He said his bones were sticking out everywhere as he lay on top of his wife that he was trying to protect. She still managed to catch a non-fatal bullet wound to the head. Tony, she was pregnant at the time and she got a gunshot wound to the face and lost a tooth. Thankfully, she survived and so did her unborn child. Those are just a few of the victims of this absolute massacre. The devastation caused was catastrophic. After the shooting, Holmes was initially detained at the Aparo Centre and placed on watch. He was placed in solitary confinement to protect him from other inmates, which is standard protocol in high-profile cases. At one point leading up to his vile acts, Holmes contemplated becoming a serial killer, but eventually dismissed the idea, deeming it too personal, risky and easily detectable. On July the 23rd, 2012, Holmes made his first court appearance in front of Judge William B. Sylvester in Sentinel, Colorado. He was informed of his rights and bail was denied because of the seriousness of his charges. The judge issued a protective order for Holmes' defence and assigned the Colorado State Public Defender to represent him. During the court appearance, Holmes remained silent and avoiding eye contact with the judge. His disorientated and confused demeanour raised questions about his mental stability. Prosecutors in Colorado charged James Holmes with 24 counts of first degree murder, 116 accounts of attempted murder, possession of explosive devices and inciting violence. On July the 30th, additional charges were added. Holmes was charged with one count of murder with deliberation and one count of murder with extreme indifference for each individual targeted and killed in the massacre. He agreed to waive his rights to a preliminary hearing and it was postponed to December. Prior to the scheduled hearing on November the 15th, it was reported that Holmes had made several attempts to unalive himself. On January the 7th, 2013, Holmes returned to court where 911 calls were presented as evidence, all from the movie theatre that night. Revealing previously undisclosed information, Holmes' defence team argued that he suffered from mental illness. His attorney stated that Holmes would willing to plead guilty to avoid the death penalty, but the prosecution did not accept these terms. They announced their intention to seek the death penalty, and the trial was set to begin in February 2014. In response, Holmes' defence filed an intent to plead not guilty due to reasons of insanity on May the 7th, 2013. Following the rejection of multiple pleas for delays, jury selection for Holmes's trial began on January the 20th, 2015. The process took three months with a staggering 9,000 people summoned, making it the largest jury summons in American history. The trial officially commenced on April the 27th with the prosecution's opening statements. They argued that Holmes intentionally went to that movie theater with the goal of causing mass casualties in a shooting spree. His defence admitted that Holmes was a shooter but claimed that he suffered severely from schizophrenia, a mental disorder that made it impossible for him to control himself. Prosecution testimony began on April the 28th and continued for the next three weeks, featuring the accounts of numerous survivors from that very night. On May the 27th, Dr. Reed testified that James Holmes in fact did have a severe mental disorder. He was diagnosed with schizotypical personality disorder, which is characterized with peculiar behavior and difficulties in relating with others. Tapes of Reed's conversations with Holmes back in 2013 were played in court on May the 29th, in which Holmes discussed his social difficulties and violent and paranoid thoughts. He also mentioned his belief that he thought that federal officials were pursuing him at the time of the shooting hoping they would apprehend him before he committed these murders. Holmes claimed that his thoughts shifted from hurting himself to homicidal ideas after his breakup with his girlfriend on July the 16th. After more than 12 hours of deliberation, they found Holmes guilty of all 24 murder charges, 140 counts of attempted murder, and one count of possessing explosives. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole 
Due to James Holmes' mental state, one juror opposed the death penalty and two were left undecided. After being assaulted by another inmate, he was secretly moved to an undisclosed location outside of the state. When it first came out, I believed it was an act. Now I'm older and reading into this case some more, I do believe he is insane, but that doesn't change how vile and evil his acts were. What are your thoughts? Was he truly evil? On your screen now is the Freezer Mom case. Or over here, if you prefer, there is the cannibal case of Austin Harriff. Hit all the good buttons, I'm on podcast and TikTok too.